Um, my name is Steve Wexen, and I'm honored to be here tonight. I'm curious to see how it works out, too, because I've never done one of these things. And I do have a, a question for Doug. Is, has everybody lived through this? <laughs> the speakers, I mean. <laughs> I was thinking about this. Well, if you remember Alan West and the, the comet hypothesis on the paleo, that talk got really heated. So I don't think we're going to get any, any of that level of heat tonight. So I seem not to not have my back to a door. That's interesting. <laughs> Um, and I'll, I'll say this beforehand that no, no written questions from the back table back there. <laughs> I want to see the eyes. <laughs> um, I'm at the University of Colorado in Boulder, Colorado. I used to live here. Um, did a little bit of work with Center for Desert Archaeology, which or Desert Archaeology Incorporated, um, which is a superb organization. Um, worked at Arizona State Museum, which is another superb organization. Um, would be back here in a second because I've been very struck with the. I gave a talk two nights ago where there was actually a, a one-woman band in the next next room over. <laughs> and thank God she didn't sing any songs that I knew or it would have been completely lost. Um, I don't know if we can do anything about that. See, it's already throwing me off my, my stroke here. Um, OK, yeah, love Tucson and, and the archaeological community here is just tremendous. Uh, and the public interest in archaeology is just uh, something that other cities can envy. Um, I was curious about doing this because I wanted to see maybe we could start doing this in Boulder. I cannot imagine this many people turning up for an archaeological event in Boulder. I mean, you're, you're to be congratulated on your enthusiasm. Um, when I gave Doug a title for this, I was not entirely clear on the format. <laughs> so it was something about the end of members, where did, where did members go and where did Casas Grandes come from? And it's supposed to be demography, which is like population numbers. And I'm working on something that, that involves a lot of picky stuff about carbon-14 dating in Chihuahua and whatever. And it would have required a PowerPoint. And you're very fortunate that that's not the talk I'm going to give tonight. Because, <laughs> and that was pretty data heavy. I thought what I'd do, given that I, I, I have 20 or 30 minutes or whatever, is just talk about the problem, set the problem up a little bit, and what I think I'm, you know, my approach to tackling it and maybe why it's interesting. And by that point, it'll probably be 30 minutes into it. Um, probably not going to use this thing except to write down a couple of words so you know what I'm saying. Um, talking about. Membres, all right, Spanish word for willow. It's a, it's a creek and a nice little river, actually, over in New Mexico. And Paquime, which is also known as Casas Grandes, not, not Casa Grande, but Casas Grandes down in Chihuahua. So when I'm using those words, I hope everybody can, you know, some sense of what I'm saying. Um, put that where it's available. Uh, Membres archaeology. Um, the, the part of members, and I was looking frantically for somebody that would have a, a cap on or, or a, a, a necklace or something that would have members art on it, because you all have seen members art, whether you know it or not. Um, this is southwest New Mexico, maybe you know, at its height, about 1000 AD to 1130 AD, something like that. People there in southwest New Mexico around Silver City, that part of the world, north of Deming, well north of Deming, um, made some black and white pottery, which, which we find really remarkable. This is where it would be nice to have some some visuals, but you've seen this stuff. It's all the little people doing things and these composite, i um, thinking of stuff in our collection at the, at the University of Colorado, rabbits holding flowers that, that are also rattlesnakes. Uh, scenes from everyday life, we have a pot where there's a couple guys taking down a bighorn, or excuse me, yeah, yeah, bighorn. Um, and other pots where a fellow in a horned serpent rig is taking the head off of, of another guy. I mean, they're, they're scenes that seem like everyday life and they're scenes that don't seem like everyday life. Um, big investment in that art and for those people. They, they put a lot of time, uh, art may be the wrong word. They put a lot of energy into this ideologically charged stuff that we call art on the inside of pots. And you have seen this stuff. If you've been in almost every major art museum has some of this. It's a, probably one of the, maybe the most famous art style, if you will, from the ancient Southwest. I mean, you, you can see it in museums in Berlin and Tokyo and you know, London 
and obviously every every museum in the Southwest and, and what the major art museums in, in, in the US. So we like it a lot. It appeals to us and it has some significant value in the art market, which isn't good for the sites because the sites get all chopped up and destroyed. Turns out in the past, other people didn't like it. When they when they get to making that figurative art, and, and that's only on a some fra uh, fraction of, of all the, the painted pottery that, it, that they do. That stuff doesn't travel very far from the Members Valley, or from where it's made, the Gila, the Members, and the Rio Grande, a um, band of, of where these Members villages were. And I'll get to the villages in a minute, because that's really what I want to talk about. Um, I just talked to Patty Crown, who's a professor up at the uh, University of New Mexico. And Patty has reanalyzed hundreds of thousands of sherds from Pueblo Benito at Chaco Canyon, which is a place where I've worked a lot. And Pueblo Benito, is, it's exactly contemporary with Members. And Chaco and Benito in particular was a magnet for anything that was weird in the Southwest. It shows up at Benito. So I was talking to Patty, they looked at all these sherds that, that were excavated in the 20s, and said, oh, you know, you got any members in there? I said, no. <laughs> this is stuff that we think is wonderful, but it was, I, I think it was so uh, ideologically charged that it meant something to those people in southwest New Mexico who made it, and, and the folks in their village, and whatever. But you wouldn't want to be eating your Wheaties out of a bowl that shows some guy in a, in a plume, in a horn serpent rig taking somebody else's head off <laughs> if you're outside of that area. I mean, that's what those guys believed, and, you know, unless you're a part of that, part of that world, like a Chaco, for example, which isn't that far away, or over here, which isn't that far away, uh, you wouldn't see it. The early member stuff travels. Before they, before they get really fancy with their art, and fancy is the wrong word, before they, they invest all that ideological energy in their art, the early stuff travels. You, know, you get a lot of it in Phoenix, you get some of that Chaco, you get it lots of, lots of places. But once they lock into whatever that means, from, 11, from 1000 AD to about 1130, it stays there, it stays home. Um, so Memphis is maybe 20-odd villages. I was out on one of the biggest ones that ever was in the Red Rock Valley uh, a few days ago with the Center for Desert Archaeology people looking at what's left of that. Half of it got bulldozed. Um, living in medium-sized agricultural towns, maybe a few hundred people, uh, totaling somewhere between five and 7,000 folks, I suppose, on the, members, on the Members River, on the Upper Gila, and on the Rio Grande. It's a very, very large member site in the Rio Grande. Um, Along about 1125, 1130, somewhere in there, they quit painting the pottery, and the archaeologists some time ago thought they kind of disappeared. It's kind of, they talked about the members' collapse. They really had you know, this fairly successful long-term uh, society in southwest New Mexico that, like, somebody throws a switch at 1125, and they vanish. Or it seemed like they vanished. So it seemed like somebody fought over a starship and beamed them up or something like that. Um, certainly there's major demographic decrease there. Collapse is not a bad word for what happens demographically in terms of numbers of people. Uh, it, that's been a puzzle. I mean, it's like the Mr. the Anasazi, except it wasn't nearly as exploited as, as that old chestnut is up around Cortez and Dolores and places like that, Mesa Verde. Um, more recent work, for, and more recent, <laughs> I'll date myself, more recent work in the 1970s. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I'm going to have another sip of beer here. Um, <laughs> um, revise that somewhat. I mean, you didn't have a spaceship come, come around and beam up 7,000 people. Um, Peggy Nelson, in particular, uh, has been working on where did they go, but other people that work in Members Valley work on where did Peggy Nelson's up at Arizona State University. And there certainly are some people that left in the Members Valley after, after 1130. It seemed like a complete abandonment because the archaeologists couldn't see them. They switched from building in, in stone masonry to adobe. Those, high, those sites are harder to see. And instead of making this very eye-catching black and white pottery, that you're walking across one of these sites and you see shards of the black and white stuff, oh, you know, you can see those. Something major happened where the same, the grandchildren of the people that made that pottery that we like so much and that was, you know, so much invested in, in the dec not decoration, in the depiction of designs and events in those pots. They go from that to pottery uh, bowls that are smudged black, burnished, polished on, on the interior, and brought to a high shine. And when you look in them, you know, you basically, maybe you can see the reflection of your eyes. I, uh, folks that listened to me last night, I think I talked about this last night as well, show like an anti-design. They went from all this investment in, these, in the interiors of the bowls to stuff where there's nothing. It's like looking into space. And you know that something something changed in their ideologies, and it was major. Something changed in their demography. Something changed in their settlement. Uh, they 
they say, hang around the Members Valley, but there's a lot fewer of them, and they move out of those big sites. Whatever's going on in those big sites, they don't want any part of that anymore. They move slightly downstream, and, and some small portion of the folks that lived in those, in those larger villages at, at 1100 AD, you know, maybe a fifth of them or an eighth of them build another little adobe site, but just downstream. And the rest of them shoot off into the desert. Oh, actually, they go in all directions. Peggy Nelson has a bunch of bunch of yokels up in the hills who, you know, some of them continue to paint their pottery. It's like the old-time religion people. Uh, but there's not many of them up there. Uh, some of them move north. Some of them, you know, they sort of scatter the four winds. But I think the bulk of them go further out in the desert. They start, they start a wandering in the desert. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So the, the members collapsed. You know, archaeologists don't, you know, they get annoyed about terms. So we don't use collapse anymore. It was dramatic, whatever it was. And it was a plunge in population in the members' valley in those old sites. A shift downstream, complete reorganization of their ideology, in, insofar as we can know it from what we call art, and complete reorganization of ideology. They just turned their backs on what was there before and marched boldly on, or, or tentatively on, in new directions. So that's the members thing. Where did members go? And I'm going to get back to this, where I think it went. Well, actually, I get to it right now. Now, where did Pocky come from? <laughs> okay. Um, members ends about 1125. Oh, that sort of members ends about 1125. The people are still there. They're just out in the desert near Deming and places like that, living in sites that are hard to see. Um, Pakime was the last and greatest city in the, in the Pueblo Southwest. It wasn't, it, it, would, it certainly would have a rival in what was going on under Phoenix at the same time. But let's leave Phoenix out of this. Let's leave Holocom out of this. For, for Pueblo places that are part of that Pueblo world, this is the last and their last and greatest city, and it's in Chihuahua. It's in Mexico, 60 miles across the border. It's still, it's still part of the Southwest, all right? Uh, we didn't know much about it because it was in Mexico, and U.S. archaeologists were tentative about working over there in the 20s. Well, there were border troubles in the 1910s and 20s. Um, but the, the first great archaeologist in the Southwest, a guy in the 1880s named Adolf Bandelier, he, he had gone down there, and he said, this is where we should dig first. That was his conclusion in the 1880s was, you know, dig this one, dig Pakime first, all right? And all the rest will then be made clear. Nobody took him up on it until the 1960s, all right? Um, and in Charlie de Peso, who is with the Amarin Foundation, which is a, an hour east of town here. I hope, I hope you all know that place. Um, Charlie de Peso took a chance on it and worked, working in conjunction with Mexican archaeologists. Uh, excavated about a third of the site. And what a third it was. The uh, place is just amazing. Again, this is where visuals would help. Um, I'll see what kind of word pictures I can paint here. It's a huge adobe city, multi-storied, uh, you know, four or five stories in parts. Actually, when the conquistadors come through, they say it's all decked out and gaudy and painted and everything, but we don't see that. Um, it was in ruins when the conquistadors come through. But they had stories about it. Uh, and when you get into it, all kinds of stuff, all the wealth in the world, and very cosmopolitan wealth and wealth from all directions, or wealth may be the wrong term to, term to use here, but um, lit tons of shell, I mean tons of shell from the Pacific, from species that are from far away as, as, as Puerto Vallarta, that you know, only gets far north as Puerto Vallarta, well, they're bringing that shell up to northern Chihuahua. Um, pottery from everywhere, uh, let's just let, let the pottery go. Uh, copper artifacts, uh, these really fancy copper artifacts that in Mesoamerica, were, were very important. They were symbols of power. Not everybody got to have a little copper belt. I mean, a copper belt, a little like a little sleigh belt. It doesn't sound very impressive to us, but in those times, only important people had those things. Those are mostly from West Mexico. And I got corrected on where macaws and stuff come from, but they're down there somewhere, all right? Uh, way down there. Different part of Mexico. Um, De Peso dug about a third of the site, maybe a quarter of the site, third of the site, something like that. And I'm going to get corrected on this, because right now I can't remember if it was 300 or 500 macaws. Anybody know? 300? 300 is enough. <laughs> OK. These are tropical birds, all right? And they aren't keeping them for house pets they're, or lap, lap pets. They're keeping them for the feathers. And the, there again in Mexico, in Mesoamerica, feathers are extraordinarily important. When, when, when the conquistadors are shaking down the Aztecs and saying, give us stuff, give us your most valuable stuff, they bring them feathers. And of course, you know, the conquistadors, are, they're not amused, all right? But the Aztecs aren't putting them on. Right? They say, oh, OK, you don't want these. What do you want? Gold. Oh, OK, we'll give you gold. We'll keep the feathers. You know? <laughs> it's that kind of a deal. They're extremely important, and only important people got to wear them. If you were wearing pretzel feathers and you weren't the emperor, you wind up on top of the pyramid being, having a very unpleasant afternoon. Um, the Pocky makes full of that kind of stuff, not just baubles and trinkets and stuff that moves, but architecture. 
there's just a mix, a, a fabulous mix of architecture there where you get T-shaped doors, which are from the north. You know, the T-shaped doors that you see at Mesa Verde and places like that. I mean, those, those, are, those are all wrapped up in the politics of the northern Pueblo world uh, prior to 1300. After 1300, you never see a T-shaped door up there again. I mean, there's a couple in some of the Pueblos. You get T-shaped doors all over Chihuahua and, and all over Pakime. Okay, so they got this, all these northern doors, and the doors are, you know, this is not a minor thing. This is a very symbolic shape. It's not, it's not a utilitarian thing. That's how a door looks. If you're part of whatever world that is, it does T-shaped doors. When did I start? <laughs> okay. uh, fast forward, fast forward. Okay, where did Pocky may come from? De Peso thought that it was a bunch of local yokels who were doing nothing special until a whole bunch of guys from Mexico came up and said, this is what we're gonna do now, boys, and made them build them a, a city. Um, De Peso dies. Uh, his notions were not in tune with the times, with the ar archeological tenor of the times. Uh, the next guys to actually work around there are Mike Whalen and Paul Minnis, both good friends of mine who aren't here tonight, because uh, I'm probably, in the course of answering some question, I'll probably make fun of them. Um, but they're, you know, good archaeologists. Fast forward, cut to the chase. Uh, when they started working down there, it was almost 20 years ago, I sat down uh, at a cafe someplace or other over a cup of coffee with those guys, and they said, okay, you've had to pay so, with all these wild stories about guys from Mexico and all this stuff that, you know, we don't want that. They said, we're from Michigan, which means they were trained at the University of Michigan, which is relentlessly ecological and, and evolutionary. I remember them saying this, it, as Paul said it, because he's got the sense of humor. Um, oh, well, you know, these are wonderful guys. I mean, these are friends of mine. They're, they're good guys. But Paul said, we're from Michigan. We're going to make it small, and we're going to make it local. <laughs> and that's what they proceeded to do. They've written books and books and articles and articles about how the peso is wrong. It really is a local evolutionary development right there in the Casas Grandes Valley. And, you know, you go out there and you look at these eye-shaped ball courts. Did I mention the eye-shaped ball courts? <coughs> didn't get to those, did I? Oh, yeah, the T. Okay, yeah, you got to dot your eyes and cross your T's. You have the T-shaped doors, which is northern. You have these ball courts, which are the same kind of ball courts you get in Tula and Chichen Itza and places like that. Not the, not the oval guys you have around here, but these are, these are the real deal. So you get this mix of Mexican stuff and uh, Mesoamerican stuff and northern stuff. You ought to look at this stuff and say, okay, make it local if you can. I mean, I, I don't know why. Why would you want to make it local? But uh, they've tried to build a model of how Casas Grandes comes from a local development, a local evolution, the kind of stuff that archaeologists were taught in the 70s. Problem is... A problem is that when De Peso worked there, he couldn't find a whole lot of earlier people. He couldn't find people that stayed contemporary with the members in the 12th century. This thing is, excuse me, this thing is mostly after 1300. You know, it might start 1275, something like that. But there's, there's a, a century in between these guys. He couldn't find in that valley, in the Rio Casas Grandes Valley, which is a nice valley. You know, it's a, it's, it was the breadbasket of Chihuahua for a long time in historic times. Couldn't find a whole lot of earlier folks to build a city. And the city doesn't stand alone. There's, there's secondary cities and tertiary and towns and whatever down there. There's a lot of people by 1350 in that valley, and there's just in a lot of people before that. At least that's what the peso said. Mike and Paul looked and looked and looked and looked, and they couldn't find early sites either. They looked for 20 years. And, you know, they find a few sherds that were earlier here and there, but they couldn't find any major earlier populations. It's, there were people, certainly people in Chihuahua, uh, prior to that, down south where Jane Kelly's working. But in that valley, it might have been empty. It might have been fallow. And that's a, that's a pattern. I'm looking back there for Roger Ingen. That's a pattern that's been suggested for north of the border is that you have a valley that gets occupied. They cut down all the trees. They you know, hunt out all the game. They go to the next valley and then let it regenerate. So that notion of a valley being empty isn't wild or peculiar. It's just they don't talk that way in Michigan. <laughs> okay. All right. So I think... You need a whole bunch of people to get this place built. I'm not, I'm not saying who's calling the shots here. It's a combination of people from Mexico, people from up north, and local folks. They're, they're deciding that they're going to build this really cosmopolitan city. I think the northern folks are really important in all this, but that's a whole other story. But you, you, need, you need bodies to get the job done. Well, we've got 7,000 unemployed members up here <laughs> who have disappeared out in the desert. They're wandering in the deserts, and they're building these sites that we can't really see very well. They're adobe walls. And I don't think they got beamed up in a spaceship. I don't think they all went up. I don't you know, just a tenth of them went up in the mountains or whatever. You gotta put, you gotta do something with them. But there's a century in between these two. That's a problem. So my next research this summer is gonna be, I don't have to write this up here, it's Black Mountain. <laughs> it's a site just north of Deming that the um, St Stephen Locks Members Foundation 
Paul Minnis, in fact, uh, helped survey this, which means you go out and you look at what you can see from the surface. And what they saw from the surface, it's about 12 and a half miles north of Deming, which I'm going to work there this summer, but I'm not going to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. I'm, not, I'm not planning on enjoying it all that much. But the archaeology could be very cool. Could be very cool. Um, they looked at it and said, oh, this, is, you know, this would fall chronologically based on the pottery. This would fall chronologically, and there's 300 rooms here. That's a big site. That's the biggest site in the Members Valley, probably. It's, it's certainly as big as any, any earlier members village there. It changes the demography. I mean, instead of having a members collapse, you have a members decline, but that's a lot of folks. It's not the only site of that time period either, but that's, that's the big kahuna. Um, it got really badly used after that. It got, not bulldozed, but graded over, so it's kind of hard to see what's out there. We're going to stick holes in it and see, does it really date to that time period? And if it does, how big is it? And whatever. And if it falls out the way that it looks like it's going to fall out from the, from the surface ceramics on it, it looks like it does date to that century in between. And it doesn't solve the problem of where all these guys came from, but geographically, it's, okay, it's the south end of the Members Valley. Here's the Members Valley. There's Pocky Main. Black Mountain's there. Chronologically, Member Sands, I got this upside down here. Member Sands, Black Mountain, Pocky May begins. And I think those, these guys were a big chunk of the population that built this place. Not all of it, but a big chunk. The art historians who look at the pottery of Pakime, called Ramos Polychrome, doesn't look like the black and white stuff of the members, but the art historians see, say, see a lot of continuities and archaisms and stuff like that in, in the Ramos Polychrome that hark back to members, members' forms. Okay, I'll, I'll say one more thing and then stop. Um, I mentioned the plume serpent, I mean, horned serpent guy. The pot, the members' pot has a, a guy with a horned serpent rig that's, you know, he looks like a serpent. He's got this on his head with a, with a horn coming up, and he's taking somebody else's head off. That's the first place you see that in the Southwest. It comes from Mexico. That's the first place I'm aware of that you see that in the Southwest is some guy, in, in, you know, a human being, dressed as a, horn, as a horned serpent, doing something really nasty to another, another person. At Pakime, it's all over their pottery. The horned serpent's all over their pottery. And on the west end of the site is an effigy mound, which who does effigy mounds, of the horned serpent. It runs straight north-south. It's a football field long. <laughs> That, that was a big deal for those guys. So, um, okay, I think I've said my piece. It's an open-ended research question at this point. Is where did these guys go? Where did this come from? Uh, there's you know a number of different arguments on both ends, but I think we we might have a, not a solution necessarily, but a, a, yet another yet another take on on how this happens if Black Mountain turns out to be what Black Mountain appears to be this summer. So, now do I? duck fruits and sausages and stuff like that? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, this is an excellent opportunity just to see how the process of archaeological science works. How you, how you come up with an idea that you want to research and how you're going to translate that research into a, a field project. So I think this is exactly the sort of, sort of talk that we want to be, be presenting at these cafes. So I thank you, thank you a great deal already. Um, so we will open the floor to questions at this time. I would ask to raise your hand, wait for the microphone to get to you so that we can get the question uh, recorded on the tape. And um, that way it'll make sense for everybody on the internet. So with that said, I'll start taking questions. I see one. Well, the architecture at, at <coughs> Pakame doesn't look anything like Membrae's architecture. So are you saying that there were people from the north who built these T-shaped doorways who came down there and be hired these membranes to, to do some work? Did that go out over the, the PA? <laughs> did, did you hear that in the back? Yeah. OK. A um, couple of different answers to that. Uh, and the question is why, you know, Pocky May does not look like a member site. Pocky May is a century and a half later than, than the member sites. Things don't stand still. Nothing in the Southwest looks like a member site later than members. Um, actually, there's a few nasty little things that do, but um, <laughs> yeah, er, architecture, there's, a, there's a, a sea change in Southwestern, especially Pueblo history at about 1300, where they lose all the little kivas, they, you know, all the stuff that makes Mesa pretty, Mesa pretty. They don't do any of that stuff anymore, but the people are still the same people. So architecture changes. What, what I find interesting are these details, the T-shaped doors, those kinds of continuities in different in a different fabric. Um, Pocky May is adobe, massive adobe, massive adobe wall. Like I said, you know, four stories tall. Well, you got Casa Grande up here, which is multi-storied, but it, 
Audible Adobe is not a real good medium or fabric with which to make a four-story building. <laughs> okay. So the guy, I think the guys coming down there, or the guys coming up, say, I want tall. And the local guys are saying, well, is this is how we do it. You know, if that's what you want, we're going to have to build it this wide. And we'll, and, you know, no guarantees. <laughs> it's going to stand. You know, there probably were some flops before they finally figured out how to do it. They made them build forms that were not foreign to the area, but uh, not suited to that, that fabric. That happened to Chaco, too. I mean, guys, guys came to Chaco and said, build me a four-story building out of this masonry that people had that was good for one story. Didn't work. It failed. So, you know, you can sort of see these things happening. Um, if this, you know, I, I can't imagine after a century and a half that, that you would have the details, not that there's a whole lot of specific details to member stuff. There are some uh, details that would, would have continuity over that length of time. So it doesn't bother me all that much. It's, the, it's the, actually the important stuff. What a door looks like. <laughs> you know, that's important. And what a wall looks like, doesn't matter. You got you know, plastered with mud anyway. It could be stone, it could be mud, you know, or adobe, whatever. Is that even close to answering that question? Okay. Next. Um, I just wanted to go back to the jump between Membrace Pottery and Ramos Pottery in Pocky mm -hmm. May. You made a very quick statement about, and I missed that part, <laughs> about how you feel the two are connected. Uh, I'm, I'm paying attention to Barbara Millard and other people, art historians, who have looked at, at those two traditions, and they see connections in it. I'm not an art historian. You know, in terms of vessel forms, in terms of color schemes, they couldn't be more different. But the flip side of that is that the, the same guys that made Mesa Verde black, the children of the same people that made Mesa Verde black and white, which is a black and white, made polychromes 100 years later, after 1300. All across the Southwest, there's a shift from black and whites to polychromes. It's, uh, this isn't specific just to, to, to members in, in Pocky May. This is, this is across the whole region that there's these shifts. I mean, it, there's, more, there's more, to, more to life than just these two guys, although they're pretty important. Um, I think if I'm remembering what Millard and some of these people say, and even Jerry Brody, especially Jerry Brody, um, it's more on the content. You know, it, it's different forms. I mean, Casas Grande stuff is modeled. It's three-dimensional. I mean, you have three-dimensional images of people and, and, and macaw heads poking out of jars and stuff like that, where, where remember, it's two-dimensional. You have the, you know, you have two-dimensional canvas there that they're working in. But a lot of the content is the same. Uh, that, that's not a good answer because I'm not an art historian. But I, you know, I like it, so I cite it. <laughs> it agrees. I find it agreeable. <laughs> uh, given that most of the figurative membrane bowls are actually found with graves, what's the significance of the fact that they haven't been found wide, widespread across a greater geographical distance? Uh, the, the question is that a, an awful lot of the, the whole vessels are found with graves. And does that, does that tie into the, what I said earlier about it being fairly localized stuff? And, uh, first off, there's a lot of members' pots that don't make it into graves. I mean, that's why they're littered, you know, the, the surface is littered with these things. But in fact, they, you know, they are, they are a typical grave offering, even though they are used for many other things. I would think that would reinforce the argument I was making earlier that that meant something fairly s specifically ideological to that group of people. That you're very, I don't know, I'm getting too much detail here, I guess, but dig a hole in the ground under, under the floor of a room. Yeah. And actually, the rooms that turn then basically into mausoleums, I guess, where you dig a hole in the floor, put the person in it, tucked up, and then put a pot upside down over their head. So that's what they're seeing. They're seeing the inside of the pot. And as Moodle Art again, you know, had a wonderful book called Beneath the Underworld Sky. That, you know, that's what you're seeing through eternity, is what the, the image in that pot. And, um, and was, were there any sherds of, of similar design found in the uh, Black Mountain survey? At the Black Mountain site? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Black Mountain site's about a kilometer long. This is going to be more details than a lot of you want. It's about, a, excuse me, half a kilometer long. One end of it, and this is what we were seeing yesterday, what I was seeing the last two times I was out there. One end of it, there's some member stuff. The other end of it, there's some late stuff with Ramos Polychrome and Gila. And in the middle is pottery that, that works, uh, specifically, uh, um, St. John's Polychrome, St. John's Polychrome, Chup, and, and sort of middle range El Paso for those of us who are aficionados of this stuff. But it, there's a little bit of it there, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, 
uh, as an artist, I've been very interested in the uh, archaeological um, designs on the members' pots. And I've seen some very, very similar um, iconography related to Hopi and Zuni uh, iconography and Kachinas. Like, for example, in one pot I saw a dancing Kashari. That's in the Peabody mm -hmm. Museum. It's mm -hmm. pro pro probably very famous. But I've seen many uh, of those pots that re resemble Hopi Kachinas and Zuni Kachinas. Is there any relationship? Could that be a relationship? Could the members have gone there? Yeah, I think so. Um, some people don't. I, I do. I mean, again, I'm not an art historian. But um, uh, Roy Carlson, um, Polly Shaftsma, uh, both identify what they think are Kachinas in, in members' pottery. Um, I, th I think you can make an argument that members is where some of that stuff actually starts. And I'm looking at Chuck here, ready to duck. <laughs> but, um, some of those, you know, Kachinas are a many splendid thing. I mean, there's hundreds of them in there. Some of them are ancestors, some of them are this, some of them are that. So it's not like all Kachinas come out of one hole in the ground. Um, but there are images that look to archaeologists' eyes and art, artists' eyes. That that's where you start to recognize things that are Kachinas. doesn't mean that the early rock art isn't, but we, you know, it doesn't look like it to me, for whatever that's worth. Um, I think some of that comes from the way members' villages, why they got so big. Because when I was talking about five to 7,000 people, that's a lot of people from the Southwest. I, mean, I, I, I was not able to provide a lot of context around this discussion. Um, they sat in one spot because they had canal irrigation, where guys up north, the guys that Chaco was dealing with at the, exactly the same time and trying to keep a thumb on, they could move around because they do rainfall farming. So if they didn't like to be next to Chaco, they could move someplace else because it either rained or it didn't rain sort of equally everywhere. Um, when you make an investment in a canal, you're stuck. You can't pick up a canal and move it. <laughs> you, know? you can't pick up the creek and move it. So they had to sit in place, and they did. They're like, like Holocom sites. That these member sites have great time. Some of them have, have centuries of depth uh, of, of living in place. That's how they get big. Um, members being normal sorts of people, um, you, know, you turn your back, and there's more of them, more of them, more of them. Uh, boys meet girls and all that kind of stuff. Um, so they get big, and they have to figure out how to hold that together without doing what Chaco was doing, which was having nobles and kings and that sort of thing. Um, apparently, they didn't do that, members. So I think they started to experiment with things like Kachinas, and you know, that eventually, much later, after you know, 1250, 1300, blossom into the most visible part of how Pueblo, the most visible part that we can see of how Pueblo people hold their hold their world together these days. Is that a fair? Okay. <coughs> Uh, excuse me. Um, uh, you, you mentioned, I think, last night that there's a lot of, uh, at the Black Mountain site, there's a, at the, the other end of it, there's a lot of uh, Roosevelt Redware, Salado Polychromes. Yeah, one end of it. Um, and in the boot heel of New Mexico and all along the border there, there are a lot of big sites that have Salado Polychrome <laughs> on them. Um, and, you know, some have speculated that Salado Polychromes are part of Pueblo groups that are migrating to areas, and others may disagree with that. But there are a lot of Salado folks, or at least people making Salado pottery, in the Boot Hill area in so southwestern New Mexico. Could you talk about what the relationship of those people, uh, how they fit into the, your discussion about Memberus and Pocky May? Um, Salado is a very distinctive, striking pottery type that is mostly associated with Arizona. Um, if somebody, if you had to say the epicenter of Tonto Basin or something like that, I mean, I don't know. Um, um, but it's very widespread. And it's probably, I, I agree, uh, that it's probably carried by people who are actually moving into new areas on the Upper Hill, particularly, and in, in further down the Boot Hill. Um, that's what was going on in Arizona when Pakime was reaching its height. That's kind of like the competition and the, the understanding I now have, and I'm not, I don't work here, um, about what's going on in central Arizona at that time is it looks really flashy. You got this flashy pottery and they're building these big platform mounds. It looks really flashy, but it's really falling apart. I mean, it was called the classic period by the archaeologists early on because it looked really cool. But again, when you get into the nitty gritty of it, it was grim. I mean, you talk about populations just plunging and you know, warfare and all that kind of stuff. So it's falling apart just as Pocky May is rising. Pakime was a big draw. You know, it was the bright lights of the big city. And 
you see the whole southwest kind of sagging towards it. They're, they're Mesa, I worked on a Mesa Verde site for Truth of Consequences. <laughs> you know, it's just way far, a, a migrant Mesa Verde site near Truth of Consequences, which is way beyond where Pueblos are now. Mesa Verde's up here, you know, when they leave at 1220 or whenever they start to go, they mostly stop at, at I'm going to get this backwards, Hopi and, and uh, uh, Zuni and Acoma and along the Rio Grande, but some of them shoot straight on through and, you know, are heading south towards, towards the big city, I think. There's something going on in Chihuahua, it's just a big draw. And people may be scared of it, people want, might want to be part of it, but I think that may be part of why that population is sort of pressing that direction, and sagging that direction, is that there's interesting things going on. I'll take the plunge here. Um, Northern Chihuahua is not an easy place to work. Okay, I was gonna ask, I wanna ask a question. Who's been to Casas Grandes? Okay, good, good. Because you know that, that really needs a lot of context. For, for folks that haven't been there, it really is an amazing. It's an amazing place. It's a tough place to work right now because of you know that poor country and stuff that's going on down there. Um, so people haven't done a lot of survey, meaning going out and finding where the other sites are. De Peso, the guy that first dug there, did. He, he, he composed a map that showed where all, not all, but where a lot of the settlements that were contemporary to this place were. And all the information we have is that map, and he has different symbols for small, medium, and large. And I'll tell you, the small site is from you know ten rooms to twenty rooms or something. And I looked at that map, and I, I took the midpoints of his, of his categories and multiplied them out. And if the peso was right about all those sites, that was probably, the, next to the Phoenix Basin, the most heavily occupied part of the Southwest, much more than the Rio Grande at that point. You know, it's just lots of people there in the 14th century. Every place where Paul and Mike have gone back and checked up on the peso's maps I, and the peso's information, the peso's not only right, Paul and Mike are finding more sites contemporary with, you know, De Peso is underrepresenting that population. There is an enormous, there appears to be an enormous boom in population there that I don't think you can explain without bringing in lots of people. You know, people from the members, people from the west, people from the south, people from the north. I'm, I'm just, at this point, I'm just worried about what happens to the members and, and folding them into that large, very cosmopolitan population in northern Chihuahua in the 14th century. But, I just wonder if you think that uh, some of the Pueblo people that became Colado or Chihuahua might have ended up populating Hockey Bay uh, as, the, well, the, as well as in the brain. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, I think people are coming from all directions down there. I think that's why it's a vibrant city, why it's the most, you know, the, the greatest city Southwest ever saw, maybe, except maybe Phoenix. That you have all these people from all kinds of different directions. There's a lot of this pottery that, that we're talking about here. It's a very specific um, polychrome pottery at Akime. There's a lot of it. There's a room that has, I forget how many, but like 30 or 40 Gila polychrome pots stacked up in one corner. It's like they're going to ship them out or something. It's a warehouse. But there's not one, there's not a single context at Pakime, the main at the main city, with more than 20 shirts. It doesn't have a shirt of Gila polychrome in it. I mean, it's ubiquitous there. It's everywhere. So yeah, and they're, you know, they're, they're plugged into that, that city. Next question over here. Uh, yes, <clears throat> I noticed that there's a lot of similarities in the ceramics, uh, and I was just wondering, you think they were they were made by you know by these big specialized individuals or groups? Because I uh, and do you find them you know specific designs in specific areas? Because I, I look at a lot of the things you see a lot of geometrics and look very similar. A lot of mm -hmm. the the figures look like they were done by the same person. I just wondered, do you think they were done by the one, one group or maybe a, a guild, per se, or something like this? I think it varies from time to place in the Southwest. Um, I think for sure there are, are towns that specialize in pottery production. I mean, you see that in the, in the Phoenix Basin. There, you know, there's one river that makes the pottery and the other river that uses the pottery. Um, archaeologists, when they went into this in the late 19th century, early 20th century, figured that every village made all its own stuff. Every family made all its own stuff. You know, I, I'm not sure where we got that idea. Um, I'm, I was going to give you a long answer. I'll, I'll cut it short. The, there's, there's a lot more specialization than we, are, than we used to think, and I, I don't think people are uncomfortable with that anymore. Uh, you know, that there are towns that, that get into this stuff and make stuff, and then there's people that, that use it uh, and barter for it, or, or market economy for it, I mean, actual markets. On a, on a, 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 a tighter level, um, some of the art historians, and Steve LeBlanc, who is not an art historian, he's an archaeologist, um, think they can see individual artists in the member stuff. You know, they can do attributions, uh, really, especially on the high end, you know, what we would, we would consider high end member stuff, that they can, they can say particular artists, 
this is the same artist that did this one and this one and this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's on the, the ones that we would say are the la creme de la creme sorts of, sorts of pieces. Mm -hmm. But, okay, against all that, you have these widespread design styles that people share in <coughs> all through time, where the pottery, you know, the basic design systems from the Rio Grande over, over to Hopi, say it, it's 800 AD, something like that, They're, they all look pretty much alike, even though they're being made in different areas. And I, that to me is one of the big challenges in Southwest is what do those widespread distributions mean where people are sharing, the, sharing those ideas, but clearly not, they're not, not, that stuff's not all being made in one place and shipped out. I mean, that's something where people are buying into it. So the antithesis of what I said earlier about the members, that the members just stays in the members, at least at the tail end, just stays in the members. This other stuff, people are saying, oh, I want to be part of that group, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that design now. Even though I, don't, I speak a different language than that potter that you know, I see this from, that they're, they're showing some kind of membership in some larger entity. I don't, know, I don't mean a political entity. It could, it could be an ideological thing. I have no idea. Does that work? Okay. One sec. Steve, I was uh, reading an article on the web one time, and they were talking about the Membres creativity due in large part to Datura. Datura. Um, two ways to answer that one. I'll give you both because they're both good. This is where it really would help to have visuals. Just, I ask another question: Is does there, has everybody seen a Membres pot? So you know what we're talking about here. I mean, the, in addition to the stuff with the little people on it and, and the scenes and that kind of stuff, most of it actually doesn't have that. It has these you know, extremely complicated geometrics, which in themselves are just, you can get lost looking at them. Uh, at my museum, there's a woman named Anna Shepard, a long time ago, she's dead now, uh, who was just a, a pioneer in the analysis of ceramics. Um, she was not an art historian. She was trained as a chemist and a geologist. And so she looked at the chemical composition of the clay and how hard, you know, what it was made of and how it was fired. Okay, so Anna, she liked pots uh, as well as anybody else, but she wasn't going to go after them like Barbara Millard would go after them. When she got to members, she said, I'm going, how can I, how can I look at this systematically, scientifically? And she, with her uh, mineralogical training, um, developed a system of symmetries. Oh, the, sy the system's already there. They're apparently, I'm not, I'm not a geologist, but apparently there's a finite number of different kinds of symmetries. You can, you can do this, you can do that, you can do something like that. Um, that comes out of crystallography, actually. So she looked at two, you know, symmetries of stuff in two-dimensional space. And there's one pot in our collection where she wrote a book, she wrote this up in part of a book, uh, where she goes through the motions of, this is how we analyze this stuff. And so she takes an easy one, you know, members, uh, excuse me, a Mesa Verde, where these guys, like they had a rubber stamp and just went around the inside, you know, boring. Um, and then she gets a members pot. And I've held this pot in my hands, looked at it and gone, this, 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 this is wild. She says, first they did this in their heads. First they thought this, and then they flipped it. And then they did a half, you know, a double gainer or something. I don't know, you know, <laughs> you know some splashless entry, whatever. I mean, like, and, she, and she, get, she gets like eight layers into it, and she finally throws up her hands and says, I quit. You know? <laughs> and this is stuff they had in their heads. I mean, they laid it out in a pot, too. But they were doing this in their heads and, and combining it into this thing that looks chaotic. But when you look at it, no, there's, there's, there's a structure to it that's really deep. I mean, deep, 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 deep. Um, Anna Shepard didn't take drugs. I don't think I've seen pictures of her. <laughs> it seemed like that kind of person. She probably knocked back a little sherry, sherry every once in a while. Okay, the other part of this, I'm not sure if I should go here. <laughs> some of the finest replicas of members' pottery are made by some folks down here in southern Arizona who uh, live in a yard. <laughs> and, and, you know, had some, had some counterculture background. But they, they, they do superb work on this stuff where they use materials off in the Members Valley and they fired out, you know, they figured out how the kilns work and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it is their opinion that yes. <laughs> Which is probably a more expert opinion than mine. I, I never inhaled. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, you know, it, these, these designs, it does, it's going back to Anna Shepard. I mean, I'm being facetious here, but it's going back to Anna Shepard that, yeah, it, it, there, there is incredible stuff going on in the artist's head when they're putting these things together. Yeah. Oh. Okay, next question. Looking around, okay. Uh, Steve, I'm gonna 
has there been enough survey work done in the general area around Pocky May to see whether there is a um, cultural, I don't know, whatever term you want to use, a consistency or a diversity in that region of the people living in these smaller surrounding sites? Does it seem to be a big Pocky May overlay over the entire region? Or when you're talking about groups of people coming to Pakame, yeah. are you seeing vestiges of these different influences from descendant Chacoans and yeah. uh, Salado types and uh, um, members types? Uh, Mike, and Mike Whalen and Paul Minnis have done the survey work around there. Mm -hmm. And to a lesser extent, but it's still significant extent, uh, Mexican archaeologists work with Ina and then some guys from Museum New Mexico. Um, it seems pretty homogeneous from what, and this is secondhand stuff. I mean, I've, I've looked at sites down there, but I've never actually done anything down there. I just write, I talk about it, and, you know, <laughs> but I don't know anything about it. Um, but yeah, it seems pretty homogeneous. It's not like you have enclaves. You, have, you don't have a, a post members enclave and a, and a Salado enclave and that kind of stuff. I, and there's limits to it. Um, you get sites with ball courts and <coughs> details, you know, important details that look like the big city, all the way to the boot heel of New Mexico. It comes just across the line in, in uh, is that Animas County down there? Uh, where you get Hidalgo County. Thank you very much. Yeah, Hidalgo County. Um, there's an end to it. And beyond that, you get Salado and stuff like that. And Jane Kelly from University of Calgary is working on the south end of it. And she, she says, here's the line where it switches from, from this society to something else. And she's pretty definite about it. So internally, it's consistent. And it, externally, it, it, it looks different than the stuff around it. Got time for one more question, and then we'll take a short break. Yeah, on the Sierra Madre there, there's a lot of cliff dwellings with the nice tea doorways yes, and goyas, and I mean, where'd those lads come from, and what's their time period vis-a-vis -vis Pacame? They're contemporary with Pacame. Okay, so you know, some of those guys went right over there, didn't they? Yeah. There's lots of cliff dwellings up in the, in the Sierra Madres. If, if you mapped, if, if those of you that were with me last night, um, if you map the distribution of T-shaped doorways, they start at Chaco Canyon. That's the earliest ones we know of. Okay, and at Chaco, there are only a Chaco and a few of the, the 200 odd county seats that Chaco had. And then there are the Aztec ruins, but they're also in the regular people's houses. You know, they get democratized. Then when everybody leaves the Four Corners, you know, between 1200 and 1300, when everybody leaves the Four Corners, you don't see them anymore. I, I actually was talking about this earlier, wasn't I? Um, yeah, they, they, and they show up all over Chihuahua, up in, up in the Sierra Madres, and you know, every major Casas Grande, or every major site associated with Pacume is full of T-shaped doors. So you know, you have dots moving around three times. Okay, we're gonna take a, a short break, let everybody set out their bells. We'll go ahead and collect any written questions. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the staff at Casa Vicente again for all of their hard work. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for the great set of questions. Well, we'll start it again in about 10 minutes. There of people who have made claims for cannibalism down there, uh, which, you know, it did happen in the Southwest. Um, I would assume that Christy Turner probably looked at that stuff because it's quite available. You know, being in Mexico, it's quite available and easy to look, um, relatively easy to look at. And I may just be ignorant here, but I'm not aware of that going on down there. Okay. Um, one final comment or question. Um, T-shaped doorways have been observed at Palenque uh, dating to around 200 to 900 AD. So do you think that, how does that fit in with this, uh, this idea of folks moving in from the south, for, moving in from the north? I think it's really interesting. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is a shape, it is a shape down in, in the, I think especially in Maya country, I don't think it gets in Oaxaca, I don't think it gets in central Mexico. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm open to ideas at this point. Cool. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't have an opinion on that one. I just think it's really, I'm aware of it. I'm, I think it's really fascinating. Indeed. Okay, well, that's all the written questions. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience tonight? Getting off easy. Wow. Well, you've been on a, a solid week of speaking, speaking engagements, so... Uh, uh, oh, wait, we've got one right that here. Would, that would be my ambulance. Okay. <laughs> With your wide experience in the members area, are there any sites of, say, 100 rooms that haven't been badly, badly damaged and just by good luck have escaped? And if so, um, 
eventually could there be work done to further clarify the uh, members? The two, two best preserved members' villages that I'm aware of, and you know, no member site has escaped some pot hunting, but at Gila Cliff Dwellings um, National Monument, sort of by accident, they picked up a very large member site called TJ Run. It's right behind the visitor center. And it was on a ranch where it was fairly well protected. Park Service picks it up. I mean, the, the, the monument's all about these cliff dwellings, which are, you know, nice cliff dwellings, but they're, you know, they're, they're not cliff palace. Um, the real, one of the real jewels, I know we have people that, that work at Hilo Cliff Dwellings here. Uh, one, of the, one of the real jewels in that monument is the TJ Ruin, which is a member site that's in pretty good shape. It's actually in pretty good shape. The other is Woodrow Ruin, which is over near Cliff, New Mexico, which has been partially, some Texans came in and worked on the south end of it in the late 60s, I believe. The state of New Mexico bought the thing and put an eight-foot chain link fence, fence around it. They're going to turn it into a monument, and for various reasons, that never happened. Um, so the local people have been protecting it, but um, you know it's had an eight-foot chain link fence around it. And one thing that's really cool about Woodrow is that that kept the cattle off, and you can see what it was like when Bandolera came through in the 1880s. They had a church the size of dinner plates. I mean, it's just it's just amazing. I mean, most of that's still there. Uh, there are maps that were made. I tried to map it a couple times. Um, but there are maps that were made by uh, Hattie and C.B. Cosgrove, Bert Cosgrove and Hattie Cosgrove, who ran a hardware store in Silver City and were just these amazing av avocational archaeologists. They mapped it in the 20s, before the, you know, long before the Texans ever got there. And their maps jive. I, I, I found their maps after we mapped it and after Stu Peckham mapped it. And then all those maps jive. So I think it's mostly still there, although it's, you know, it's been chewed up some. Um, like 100 rooms each for the two sites? Woodrow is, you know, there's been estimates up to 500 rooms for that guy. It's, it's a really big one. I don't think that's right. I think it's more like 300. Uh, TJ Ruins is just a normal one, yeah. It's, you know, 150, 200 rooms, something like that. But do you know of no plans to do any excavation there? Uh -oh. No, no. Bruce? <coughs> Steve, I'm pretty unfamiliar with members pottery other than members pottery. I mean, the, you know, the painted pictorial things. Um, but when you talked about that same black and white uh, shirts, I know you mentioned geometric, when you talk about the, the shirts that are not associated with burials, are those also the, the full pictorial things or were those preserved or reserved more for burials? Um. You find sherds of pictorial pots where you'll pick up a piece and it's got to have an owl on it or something like that. I think that's a, I think it's an excellent question. All right, um, they, I think they may be disproportionately in burials, and because because all the sites have been chewed up and blown up. I mean, you could be finding those sherds on the surface because somebody dug them out of a hole, you know, in, in 1920 or something like that. Um, having said that, I think that you know there were there were pictorial pots that were. The, the pots in our collection, for example, and every collection I've looked at, the pictorial pots, even the ones from the burials, many of them have clearly been used. I mean, the, the paint has, and the slip has been scraped off the bottoms of them with people coming in with a, a gourd spoon, you know, doing, getting out of there whatever was in there, you know, Wheaties or whatever it is. Um, so, you know, they were used during the course of the day, and if they're going to be used during the course of the day, they probably were dropped, and some of those, some of those pictorial shirt, shirts are just like every other shirt. I mean, they probably are original equipment. I guess another way of phrasing the question is pictorial compared to geometric black and white yeah. in that classic period. Were the pictorials a, a, a minority? I mean, a, a oh, yes. Minority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Far, far many, many, many more. Geom when I say geometrics, I mean these elaborate things like Anna Shepard was being so impressed with. Um, geometric pots that don't have pictures of people in them. And there's many more, many more of those than there are the pictorials. Yeah. But that stuff doesn't seem to travel either. I mean, I think there's a lot of investment in, you know, those geometrics aren't just somebody trying to give an archaeologist a migraine 50, 100 years later. I mean, there's, there's enormous amounts of symbolism in those geometrics that we probably could never tease apart. But it's that same issue that I was thinking of earlier, you have to push and pull. Is it, they weren't traded out because people didn't want them, or was they weren't oh. traded out because they aren't supposed to go anywhere I, other than they, that, that's or whatever? Or all of the, both of the whatever. above, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you stated it very well there. It's probably both. Okay, one last chance for questions. Okay. 
you know, has any effort been made to uh, look at and record all the uh, pots that are in private collections? Like I've, uh, yes. Through my research, I've seen huge collections in ranchers' homes along the Members Valley that no one knows about. I certainly didn't. And yeah. Has any effort been made to catalog those? Yeah, uh, several efforts. Um, most recently, uh, Michelle Hagman and a consortium of Steve LeBlanc and a consortium of people have, have assembled every image of every member's pot they can find, and it's going to be an online resource that's still sort of in beta. I mean, you know, it isn't open to the public just yet. But those that uh, online resource includes an earlier members, I guess they call it the members archive, which is a black and white film archive that's, that Steve LeBlanc and his people went around to every place they could find. Now those guys were archaeologists, so the doors were closed to them on a lot of private collections. This is in the, you know, in the 70s. Okay, the guy who ran my museum a guy, um, years ago, Hugo Rodek, um, he, was, he ran the CE Museum for decades, and he, he was a bug guy, he studied bugs, because we're a natural history museum. But he, he got some kind of a Jones for Membris, and took like two years off, and this would be in the 50s, I think, late 40s and 50s and photographed every, he liked the figurative stuff. So he took pictures of every figurative pot he could find. So he went to some of the usual suspects. He went to the museums. Okay, that's nothing new. We know, we know those are. But he got into private collections because it was in the 40s and 50s, and he was a bug guy, all right? He wasn't an archaeologist. He wasn't the enemy. So um, we have his pictures, and I, I, sh I shared those with, those with Michelle and those guys that are pulling together this online archive, and they said, you know, Steve LeBlanc said, I've never seen these before. Jerry Brody said he'd never seen these before. Some of them. I mean, you know, we're talking about maybe 100 pots that you know, were unknown to science or unknown to scholarship before this. There's still a lot of them hiding in the woodwork, <laughs> which nobody's ever going to see as uh, people are worried about having to repatriate them or you know, they're illegally coming out of the ground or whatever. But the, the best resource right now will soon be that, that web page uh, from ASU um, shortly. I mean, I'm not sure what their reasons are for. And I, just to chip in, um, we're currently putting together a, a, a grant to do a, an equivalent of like an antiques roadshow to try and um, go to populations in uh, central Arizona and up around Sedona to have people bring in um, their collections for the purposes of some quick and dirty documentation and trying to set it up in such a way that we can sort of manage a, a way to get the information to the scholars but not encourage any further looting and um, try to do it in such a way that, that we start to take a step back from what's happened up in Blanding, because things up there are, get, are really, really pretty bad. Um, any other questions? Okay, last question tonight. It's not directly related, but I've just been wondering about this for a long time. What do you think about Chaco highways and stuff as being racetracks? People ran races between those great hunters and I mean, um, they did something with those. The things, things that we did, we call roads at Chaco, and <coughs> I, I'm, I'll just assume that everybody knows what I'm talking about here. Is that safe? Yeah. Um, aren't like stone out here. I mean, they, they uh, these guys had no wheeled vehicles. They had no beasts of burden. They didn't need something that's 10 feet wide, you know, and cut and fill and all that kind of stuff. They didn't need that. Um, you can see the difference between a, a Chaco road and a real path when they get to a cliff. When they get to a cliff with a, with a Chaco Road, they, they beat a 10 meter wide stairway into it. When, when a regular trail gets like a hand in toe holes, that's all they needed. It worked just fine. Um, people are moving on them, or they wouldn't have beat a 10 foot, you know, 10 meter wide stair up it. Uh, people are moving on them. They might be running on them. I don't know. There's a lot of running. There's a lot of running that goes on in, in, I mean, in many Native American uh, groups. Running means something different or something very important to them. There's a lot of communication going on. Um, I was describing, last night I was describing the line of sight fire signaling s network that just you know, spread out from Chaco in all directions where, where people would burn huge bonfires and, and talk to each other that way, communicate. I suspect there probably were follow-up, you know, hard copy follows. <laughs> and there's some guy chugging away down there saying, yeah, time to pay your taxes, you know, and just, just in case you didn't read the message. You know. um, Racing, you know, at Chaco, the Navajo stories about that place are all about gambling, and, and racing is gambling sometimes, mm -hmm. and there's some of that going on, where there, you know, there's races. Um, 
I don't know if we know what those roads were for, but certainly people moved on them, and they would have been, you know, a great way to have competitive races or gambling races. Uh, it's an interesting thought. I hadn't thought about that. I mean, they, I think you do more than that. I think your monuments that you know connect point A to point B and show that yeah, you're you're part of this business, just in case you forget <laughs> when you get out your door in the morning. Oh, there's that thing that leads back to Chaco. Oh yeah, see. I need to send in that corn, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> I always think of one great house racing another. You know what I mean? Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the guy who wrote the really good book on Indian running, uh, Nabokov. And I can't remember his first name. Anybody help me out here? Wrote a really good book. Peter Nabokov? Yeah. Wrote a really good book on Indian running that, that would, might be fun to, to look at. It was some years ago, a decade ago. Where, you know, it, it, it's not like a heavy scholarly tome on it. It's actually sort of interesting. Some of the highways just end. Didn't they find large caches of broken pottery at the very end, maybe ceremonial? Uh, oh, there's a, lot, there's a lot of ceremony going on in those things. Yeah, I mean, I, when we worked at Pueblo Alto, which is one of the, the big buildings in Chaco, <laughs> You know, that's where a whole bunch of roads come in, and in the what they call the trash mound there, which is probably not the right term for this feature, there are all kinds of smashed pots. You know, just like people just stood there and smashed pots because they they brought them in, they done whatever you know whatever was in the pot was out of the pot, and they didn't want to take them back, or or they it was important to leave a part of them there. You know that, you know, that it's important to leave a piece of pottery from that area here, at whatever chuckle was. I, I'm just making that part up. Um, yeah, uh, some of the roads go to natural features. Some of the roads, most of the roads go to other settlements. But some of them, you know, run straight to some big butte that's an important butte. A real canard, since you asked me. <laughs> so I think all the Great North Road that runs straight north out of Chaco. It goes to Aztec Ruins. Uh, you will read that it, it stopped at a thing called Coots Canyon. And it was totally symbolic and it went nowhere. It went to a hole in the ground and that was, that was symbolic of Pueblo Netherworld or something like that. Um, that's not true. <laughs> I mean, there is a Chaco a great house a mile beyond where it's supposed to quit, where it goes into, into Coots Canyon. There's a stairway to Coots Canyon. You know, if it's going nowhere, why'd they build a stairway? Um, and it goes down to the bottom of Coots Canyon, and a mile further down out on this fin is a great house that has no reason to be there. There's no community around it or anything. This is right where the road's going. So yeah, there's a roadside attraction, is what they call these things. There's a roadside attraction, and the next stop is Salmon Ruins, and the next stop after that is Aztec Ruins. But um, that is a pernicious canard, which I cannot somehow root out of the literature that, that the Great North Road stopped at Coots Canyon. Then on that note. <laughs> we have one last question from the back. He's going to show his face. Uh oh, going in the back now, I'm in trouble. Um, it's a bunch of archaeologists. Um, there is a recent. Uh, dissertation out of the University of Oregon that argues for cannibalism. I don't particularly believe it. I think there was a lot of processing. I don't know that it was cannibalism. At, at Casas Grandes? Yes. Okay, sorry. Yeah. It's recent, just six months ago, maybe. Um, my question is, how do you account for, I mean, tonight I get the impression that there was no one in the Casas Grandes Valley prior to Pocky May. And that's not exactly true. No, there's some. There are some people there, but right. there's not enough people it's to do that. Yeah. Not enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What? what how, how much is enough? <laughs> I guess. Um. I think there's a minimum of three thousand people at that town, and you know, there's a gentleman back here that works down here. There's lots of other smaller towns around it. Uh, I'm trying. I'm flailing here for trying to figure out what the number was that I got off looking at the Pesos map for northern northern Chihuahua. It's like 50 or 60,000, something like that. If you, if you take his map literally and say they're all contemporary and just play the game out, it's you know more than ever lived in the Four Corners. I don't think there's that many. I mean, there certainly doesn't seem to be a lot of strong evidence until you get to southern Chihuahua, where Jane Kelly works, for big pit house populations that, that would provide that many people. Is that anything close to an answer to what you asked? Yeah. If, 
if you play it against members, I mean, if you play it against members, and we know more about members' pit houses, members had a pit house period before they turned into members. Um, and I've done a lot of work on that demographic shift. And you get lots and lots of pit houses under members' towns. Most of them, anyway. Some of them get none, but you get lots and lots of pit houses under members' towns. You can't get the members' town, you can't get the members' villages out of those pit houses. And, and reconstructing population has so many assumptions and, you know, if this, if that, if this, if it was occupied for this long, that kind of stuff. I don't think you, you know, it doesn't, my take on, on what they're finding down here doesn't sound anything like the density of pit houses that you get under the big member sites, and you can't make it work in the members. I, I can't make it work in the members, so I, you know, given that the, our knowledge of Chihuahua is, my knowledge is next to none, he knows something about it, he knows a lot about it. Um, but still, you know, it, it, it's thin compared to what we know about members. Um, but given that, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think they got anywhere near enough down there to get to where they need to go. And, and I don't know of any big standalone Viejo period sites. I mean, they say in their, in their surveys, and I've asked Mike and I've asked Paul, do you have any big standalone, you know, the, just big pinhouse villages down there? No. Of course, the, you know, they, they're not, maybe not working in the areas are going to find those things. Okay, with that, I think we're going to wrap it up right. tonight. Um, if you all are interested, <laughs> thanks so much, Steve. Um, just a reminder, our, our regular cafe schedule picks up again the uh, first Tuesday of the month, uh, April 6th. We're going to have Ron Towner from the Laboratory of Tree Reading Research talking about the Pueblitos and the Tinnita, um, the onset of the Navajo people in the Southwest, and there's some fascinating stuff going on with that archaeology and the politics of that archaeology right now. So I'd invite you back for a very interesting discussion on April 6th. Uh, Bill Dolly will be your host that night. I'm going to take that night off. Thanks. <laughs> Have a great night, everybody.